button for this part. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, well, we're a small group, but um, I thought we'd still say our name, our location, so people get used to who we are. And uh, maybe today, just um, if you feel like it, say something about an activity that you particularly enjoy. And I'll start with Jana. An activity that I particularly enjoy. Um, yeah, enjoy. <laughs> um, let's see. I enjoy empathy circles. Yay! <laughs> Hi, Donna. Hi. Do you I want me? Next person? Uh, are you done, Donna? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. You didn't say an activity. Okay. Uh, Donna? She said empathy circles. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> I blocked that out. <laughs> Donna? Yeah, I don't know what to say. I, I should say empathy circles, right? I do enjoy that. Um, oh, gosh. I, I, my head is spinning in a lot of dry. I, eat, I, I enjoy eating much too much. That's one thing. But, that's uh, good. <laughs> that, that's a fun activity. Okay. okay. Um, Sally. Sally, where where do you live? Yeah, I live on in the foothills of the Sierras. Oh, okay. The way to Yosemite National Park. And um well, right now my passion is um, paleontology, and they found some fossils on my land. Oh, just a second. You said somebody's in the waiting. I don't see anybody in the wait room. I just not I don't, I don't know. So I'll let her I see okay. nine people. Um, you see, I, I'm sorry, you see a lot of people on your... No, wall. now it says 10 participants right now. Okay. I um, just to give you a heads up, I invited two of my friends who are not on the left. They're kind of middle road and hopefully they'll show up. And um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. And everybody's uh, welcome. Uh, okay, Celine, um, let's see. I'm trying to remember where you're from now. <laughs> I live, uh, oh, yeah. I live in um, Southern Oregon in a town oh. called Ashland. And um, I think currently my favorite activities, I mean, of course, after Empathy Circles is uh, <laughs> reading and um, going for walks. Great, that sounds lovely. Larry. You're in Florida. Yep, I'm in Florida, just north of Daytona, a little town called Ormond by the Sea. Um, I'm sad to say that it was the home of racing on the beach, which has become the Daytona 500 over the years. And um, something I love is empathy circles. And I also enjoy co-hosting empathy circles. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, Leo? Leo Jacoby in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, center of the state. I'm a Zoomiac, so I enjoy uh, uh, webinars and um, empathy circles, of course. You're in a hot area for helping with elections in Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a purple state. Jaron, hello. Hi. We're just, we're mentioning, we all know you're from the Netherlands and um, any activity that you particularly enjoy? Yeah, I love to cycle, I oh. cycle around, Great. bicycle, and, uh, and I love writing and thinking. Great. I always think of everybody bicycling in the Netherlands, is that true? A lot sure, of people? It's, it's the mo most uh, common mode of transport, but I also do it for fun. Good. Okay, um, my favorite activity for 46 years has been running 
and cooking. Um, as Donna said, I like food, um, but I have a meniscus thing that I'm dealing with. So I'm just doing fast walking right now. I'm not running, but I hope mm -hmm. to get back to it. Edwin? Uh, yeah, what is it for me? The uh, I guess it's empathy circles. Let's make it a, <laughs> a whole group of empathy. We love empathy circles. So and facilitating and uh, yeah, the, the running. I like to run just to get some exercise. We do a lot of sitting. So that's me. Okay. Well, um, I just mentioned to people that just got here, we know three of our regular participants had other engagements today. So we're a little bit smaller, but it'll be fun. They'll be back next week. Okay. Did everybody go or is there... I think we have everybody. Oh, Max, oh no, I, no, so. I am so sorry, Matt, Max. Your your video wasn't on before. Hi, Max. Where hi, hi, hi. Where are you? Uh, I'm in the Netherlands, like uh, Jeroen. <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, and um, well, the subjects I had been interested in before. Uh, getting to this, um, this, this, the subject of empathy. It's, um, well, philosophy, and uh, I've also uh, discussed uh, quite a lot uh, with it, and we have uh, had a lot of uh, extensive email um, uh, conversations about it, um, uh, with, with you, I mean. And um, uh, what, what, specifically interested me i'd say in insight is the uh the the contrast between eastern philosophy and western philosophy and i've also written uh, wrote, uh read quite a lot about uh buddhist uh, logic notably and uh, noting some similarities there between uh philosophy as uh, developed mainly by Aristotle logic and also developed seemingly uh, independently in uh, Eastern philosophy by uh, Buddhists. Right. Um, so, so that, that was uh, before, before I got interested in the subject of empathy. And right. now uh, <laughs> I'm here with, uh, with you. <laughs> Okay, yeah. well, you'll enjoy talking to Glenn when he returns next week, because he is a philosopher. Uh, he's been teaching philosophy for many so, years and just so. retired. Okay, so, so who uh, you say his Hi. name was? Glenn. He's in Pennsylvania. Glenn. 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 Yeah, he'll yeah. be back next okay. week. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, Aaron, hello. We were doing name, location, and uh, one activity you enjoy. Yes. So my name is Erin, and I um, am in a suburb of Chicago, and I I enjoy critical thinking and exploring um, issues related to the Bill of Rights. So this is an important book for me, and I I'm just thrilled to be a part of this this discussion. Hey, thank you. And one, I think we're everybody said okay. hello. So I'm posting that the uh, we have the uh, the book. We're on on tyranny. Twenty lessons from the twentieth century. Has everybody read the chapter? Anybody haven't? Yeah. And if you, uh, Larry, the pointing a finger of shame. <laughs> what, what, um, I, did, I did send out the video clips too, and just yeah. in case you didn't. didn't um, there there are, are videos. The chapters are very short chapters, and you can just watch the video and you get the same uh, info. And the chat, I think it's only like about eight or nine minutes uh, for each but uh, even chapter. Less even less for these two. And yeah, they were very short. Mm -hmm. And then the chapters are there. Chap Do you want to say the uh, questions? You'd come up with questions, Joan. They're in the chat. Yeah. I posted. Yeah, we, we already, I sent them out. Not, uh, chapter 11, investigate. And the question was, what negative effect can information on the internet have on us individually? 
And on chapter 12, uh, the title was Make Eye Contact and Small Talk. And the question was, what are the advantages of making eye contact and small talk? Okay, so we're gonna go into two circles. Uh, one will have five participants and one will have six or two big, we're kind of in between uh, to have like smaller groups. We want at least four. Uh, so, and so we'll have a little bit larger groups. Uh, the first one will be in the weight room and uh, Celine, if you would facilitate that, I'll, I'll be there with you. And the second group, Jana, if uh, you can facilitate that one. And Erin, you had yeah, your hand up. Yeah, I, I, this is only my third time at this book club, but both times I've been in with Joan and I would, I would just like to have a different perspective. So, Great. Um, yeah, yeah. She, you're not in here. She's going to be in the first group with me. So I, I hear you. So I'm trying to mix it up best I can. So it will be a different group. Yep. And Max, have you seen how to take part in the empathy circle? I think everyone else is familiar with the practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. You're good with it. Okay. And there is a link for anyone that needs a primer uh, to a one page how to. So we'll just go into the rooms, get right into it. And we have uh, about an hour and a half in the breakout rooms, then we'll come back for a short 15 minute uh, debrief. Uh, anything else, Joan, or we feel we're ready? I think that's okay. it. Great. See you in the rooms. And there we go. So there's six of us in this group, uh, Celine. So we're all here. Okay. And everybody is familiar with the handy dandy empathy circles. And you know <laughs> that as facilitator, I am the first listener. And um, how long are the turns? And how long do we go? Uh, we have an hour and a half. So it's up to you, four or five minutes. I don't know whatever you think is best for everyone getting three turns at least. Um, I think five minutes is okay. good. Great. People can yeah. get into it a little bit. You like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So uh, what I do is if people are forgetting to stop and so that their listener can catch up and I, I put this up and then when your time is up, I put this up. So who's ready to be the first speaker? I'll go. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. So um, investigate the first chapter. Um, I made a couple of notes. I'm looking at them. Um, Uh, one one um, fact that he came out with was um, the difference between, and we kind of talked about this a little bit last week, is between reading or investigating and um, the internet is that if you get your information from the internet, you tend to be predictable. I'll stop there. Thank you. So uh, something from the first chapter, chapter 11 is that was said is the fact of the difference that the difference between reading or investigating and the internet is that if you're going to the internet for your news, you tend to be predictable. Right, and if you read um, and really uh, choose you know, sanctioned journalists that do all the work uh, and make sure that they are actually finding individuals, digging in, writing it up, uh, then uh, you're much more unpredictable. <clears throat> and one of the advantages of that is um, right now, looking at uh, tyranny worldwide, what's happening in Ukraine, is um, it's hard to rule those kind of individuals. So if you read, 
um, and you and you're choosing material from a journalist who's done some investigating, has done the work that needs to be done to sift through information. You are not so uh, predictable. And right now, um, I'm sorry, if it's something hard, the news that is coming from Ukraine. Right. Um, I mean, you're, you're seeing it's a horrible situation and it's painful to watch. But what I am amazed with is those people do not want to be predictable. They are not easy to, to take down. They're, they're, they're going to stand up even if they're citizens of the country. And I think this is what uh, Snyder is referring to. So what you're seeing in the situation in Ukraine, which is so hard and painful to read about, to know about, is that it's amazing that to see also the strength of the resistance that the people do not want to be predictable. They do. They are not just allowing this invasion to happen. Right. And uh, something else. I'm not sure what, how much time I have. Is he was giving us a, an antidote or some positive step that we can take to to keep a hold of our democracy. And that is to support local journalism. So one of the things also that, that um, Snyder is offering is an antidote we can take to support our, our local uh, journalists and media as a way to protect our democracy. Right, and I find that um, it's a little bit frightening in terms of you hear so many of the local newspapers are losing subscribers and are having to close down. And, um, and I do uh, have subscriptions to major newspapers like the New York Times I get on Sunday um, I'm on uh, the Boston Globe. I get a summary in the morning. Um, the Washington Post, I, I get an online subscription. But I don't have a local. And uh, it just made me feel like this is something I should uh, look at because we're losing those people. And that is very important. So, um... In, in for you personally, um, you subscribe to the Sunday New York Times, Boston Globe News and Washington Post and other kind of national uh, news providers and not so much the local. And so reading this makes you rethink that and um, consider supporting lo your local news. Is that, is that pause or time? <laughs> okay, thank you. I feel fully heard. <laughs> thank you, Joan. Uh, let's see. Yeroon, would you listen to me, please? Yes, gladly. So I'm going to start with something personal um, that is very alive for me in this moment um, and is affecting me more than I thought it would. I'll pause there. All right. Uh, there's something you want to talk about, which is quite personal and that's very much alive in you. Yes, I just came directly from a memorial service for a 36 year old man whom I have known since he was three years old. Oh. Sorry. Uh, so a 36 year old man uh, had his memorial service you went to and you've known him since he was six years old, three, three years old, three years old. And his whole family and they, the 
there were five boys and they were friends with my two boys. Um, I'll, I'll pause there. Hmm. So you, your two boys were friends with the five boys that were there, which were family of him. It was your, were his real children? I'm sorry? They were his children or they were just there? For, no, 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 his brothers. They were five brothers and one died. Okay. A day ago, two days ago. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that my brain is not retaining information the way that I would like it to. So um, I'll ask you to um, forgive me that I'm not holding on to things. Okay, so you're asking for consideration that you might not hold on to the information that other people are sharing right now in this group because yeah. of the way you are affected by this uh, event. Exactly, thank you. I feel very well heard by you. And I found these chapters very uh, useful, timely, and um, I, I'm going to say rich with ideas and recommendations. Mm, so it sounds like you're quite thankful for having these chapters right now at this moment because they're very re relevant for the events that are going on right now. And they're very rich in what they are offering you. Yes. I don't know um, what people are doing for information in uh, the Ukraine. Are they getting uh, truthful information from radio or television? I don't know. You're wondering how people in Ukraine get their information. Are they getting it through the radio or the television? How does that work right now? Yes. Uh, we have a small local radio station in my town. Uh, we have a population of 25,000. Oh, so in, in, for 25,000 people, there's a small local radio station. And starting Monday, <laughs> I'm going to support them. I never have given them any financial support, but it's on my list Monday morning. <laughs> so it sounds like this reading of the book has inspired you to support your local radio station since uh, from Monday morning, you're going to do it. Exactly. And they have a, a liberal perspective. <laughs> my, I agree with their perspective. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it, <laughs> even if so, they're a small radio, <laughs> local radio station. Right. So they're supportive of your own uh, polit political view, that, which is liberal. And that, that's, that makes you even more motivated to support them. Otherwise, you might not consider it. Exactly. Thank you so much. You ruin, I feel flavored. Okay, good. Uh, Leo, uh, would you listen to me? Or did you already have a turn? I'm not sure. No, I'd be glad to. Okay, good. Um, so I wanted to respond to things that Joan said. So I wrote them down, but... Um, something about like the oh yeah because of the book it says um that um that when you listen to the internet news on the internet then uh, you become predictable and i'm not sure if i fully agree with that so joe you're citing joan who referred to last week's comment that uh using the internet and get, getting opinions there makes us predictable because it's uh, predictable speech. <laughs> it makes us predictable listeners. Yeah, and that, you that's... might not agree with that. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good uh, that you picked that up. Um, but it's not like I disagree with Joan. It's like just that uh, I, I don't think that necessarily the internet, which makes 
which like filters the news it's like i think the internet gives us a lot of choice which gives us a choice to choose people to interact with based on the, their opinions and that's actually maybe the freedom of the internet actually limits the information that we get from the network we, we choose with that freedom so an advantage of the internet is that it gives you lots of choices and it uh, gives us more freedom to choose our sources. Yeah, which means that we choose, of course, the easy way, which is people who agree with us. <laughs> <laughs> which means we might choose people that already agree with us. <laughs> so. Yeah, and then I agree with um, Joan in the sense of the importance of local for for the, for instance for this reason because people who are local we don't choose who is local to us we don't choose who's local so paying attention to local reporters and others uh, is is different than watching the internet yeah yeah because uh, well people with local I mean, just because like it's just what, what does what connects you to the people how do you choose how do you end up with the people and if local means that you have the variety that's local to you you do have variety which is a snapshot of humanity so in the local arena you have variety and uh on the internet you might go silo yourself to people that agree with you but in yeah. locally you're more likely to meet people that are different than you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, thanks for listening. I, I think I feel fully heard. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, Donna, would you be my listener? Sure. So I'm getting some peer pressure here to support my uh, local press. <laughs> so I appreciate the uh, example that Celine and Jonah have set for us today. I cannot name a local journalist. Uh, we, I think I mentioned in maybe the first week, I don't subscribe to the local paper any longer. And yet, certainly that was one of the uh, important points made in chapter 11. So you're saying uh, peer pressure to support the local press. Um, however, um, you can't name a local journalist and um, you don't, you're not su subscribing to the local paper. In uh, chapter 11, we, uh, Schneider gave the example of Václav Havel in Czechoslovakia. And if you recall, that was uh, the solidarity movement where they resisted Russian control. Pause. Okay, uh, you, you're, you're citing the chapter where he mentioned Havel, the Czechoslovakian solidarity, solidarity movement. And I was impressed that uh, <clears throat> he said that they had to pass his essay the power of the powerless, they had to circulate that illegally. You know, so it was sort of a grassroots uh, network of sharing the news and sharing uh, this political opinion. Yeah, so you were impressed because he said that his publication, uh, his pamphlet, I guess it was, um, The Power of the Powerless, was illegal and had to be circulated through grassroots effort. It made me think of the people in Ukraine and what kind of um, underground networks they are trying to establish in resisting the Russian invasion. Yeah, so it made you think of Ukraine and what underground networks they have to resist um, the invasion. and how fragile societies are. It also came out in the readings that uh, Schneider was a student of, as he is a historian of Europe, Eastern Europe. And so he knows a great deal about Ukraine and Poland and other parts of Eastern Europe. And uh, 
he noted the fragility of a society when we stop smiling at our neighbor, or when we cross the street to avoid them. It indicates some part, some kind, the social fabric has been torn. Yeah, so you're you're saying um, uh, Snyder uh, is a professor of Eastern Europe, and he knows about the fragility of societies, and he points to when we uh, stop smiling at our neighbor and avoid them by crossing the street. Um, that it, it's kind of a sign of the fragility. Yes, I think that was more in chapter 12 at that point. Um, I think that's good for now. I felt heard, Donna, thank you. Thank you, Leo. Um, there's so much. Um, oh, I have to pick someone. Who hasn't done it? Edwin, do you want to try? Yep, Me? I'll listen. Okay, I have to choose. I'll just say something quickly. I'm just struck as as many things as we know of, uh, you know, Trump got impeached for um, bullying Z Zelensky into, you know, doing things with Biden, dirty things with Biden's son and uh, saying he wouldn't get um, the military arms that he was were slated by Congress unless he did certain things. Um, as much as we know that it's horrible, I'm just struck by this. There's something fishy here. Um, this, this relationship with Putin, as much as we know about this relationship with Putin and even admiration and uh, all these things that have happened, I'm just wondering how much we don't know, <laughs> how much mm -hmm. we don't know that it's even worse. And tonight um, he's having a MAGA rally. Um, okay, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so uh, you're talking about Trump and the impeachment and his relationship with uh, Putin. And there, you think there's just a lot more that we don't even know about what what he, what he's up to, and there's even a, a rally today. Sounds like you want to explore that. Yeah, um, and he's made statements, uh, and some of the Fox News people now. I, I'm not picking that, um, picking sides particularly, but just it's. As much as we know, I think what we don't know is even worse. Um, anyway, I'm going to change subjects. I'll tell you something a little personal. So um, I have participated in representing Quakers on a local interfaith planning committee. And um, you want to just say that? And yeah, you're, uh, you're, you've been doing an interfaith planning committee with the Quakers. Yeah, I represent the Quakers. So there's Muslims, Buddhists, hmm. Jew, Jewish, you know, it's, and it's very academic focused, actually linked more than congregations. I'm actually representing meetings. But anyway, I was approached um, late Friday if I could organize a rally downtown at our square for the in support, in support of Ukrainian. Um, because this person had organized another one and he, he was having a conflict. So I, I have some medical issues and with that late date, I, I really felt I could. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's breaking up there. Yeah, I, I've Maybe. lost Maybe. You broke up there for a second, but what I heard was is they, they they had asked you to help organize, take over, organize the a, a rally for the Ukrainians, but you have health issues and the late date that sounds like you couldn't uh, do it. Yeah, so I went back to the interfaith group and I asked if anyone else wanted to do it. And uh, I got this response from a sociology professor who has supported interfaith work, who's Muslim. And he's a very gentle man normally, but he fiercely wrote, yeah, you want to do this because it's Euro white kind of thing. And it's, you know, where, where, where was it with Yemen? Yeah, the genocide in Yemen. 
and where where are you all for Palestine? And it really shocked me. It, it almost seemed hateful. This guy is usually very gentle and very reasonable. Hmm. Yeah, so you put it put out that uh, that message, and you got a response from someone who sounds like it was Muslim, and he's yet usually just very gentle, but he was just very upset, like, "Oh, this is just support for uh, sort of an ethnic European group. Where were you for Yemen and uh, all these other uh, the Palestinians?" So, and you were shocked. I'm hearing that you're really surprised and. About yeah, and he was he wasn't aiming it at me. He was saying, "Where are all of you?" And um, actually, the Quakers are very active in Yemen. Uh, they have made it their number one issue the last few years, lobbying with Congress, and they also are active peacekeeping uh, teams in Palestine. But I, I knew defending them, you know, I tried a little, and I, there was no point. Something mm -hmm. was wrong. Mm -hmm. oh, that was the time, but I'll, I'll finish that reflection that uh, trying to defend the Quakers, saying that they actually do, you know, try to support uh, the Yemen and, and Palestinians, that uh, that just it wouldn't really work to uh, try to even defend them. So maybe he just wasn't interested, wouldn't take it, wasn't interested in it. Okay. Was that close enough, or is there more? I want to be sure. No, that, was, that I is fine. Something? Thank you. Okay. I feel heard. Let me be sure I got it. I kind of got off subject a little, but it's what yeah. what occurred to me. Sure. Yeah. Whatever is alive for you uh, is fine. Um, Joan, can I speak to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. In terms of uh, information, you know, on in the internet or what what have you. Uh, I think I'm with Urim that, I mean, there's all kinds of information. It's pretty much everything's on the internet. So that doesn't quite make sense because all the newspapers, everything's on the internet. So it's the full cornucopia of information there to choose from. Okay, so you're um, in agreement with Urim that um, you feel like the comment about being predictable on the internet, on, yeah, predictable doesn't really hold for you because mm -hmm. you feel like there's a cornucopia of all kinds of information out there, all kinds of newspapers. And, yeah. Oh, okay. And and I do try to watch, you know, MSNBC and Fox and sort of the spectrum. I like to hear the different uh, the different sources because each one sort of has its own sort of filter that you can kind of you know you kind of really hear the filter that they put on on the news. And uh, so I, I just like to hear the different news sources and the filters. So you also look at a spectrum of news, including MSNBC and Fox, and you feel like they both have some kind of filter that they have on the news. Yeah, and actually, this is my news source here. I think what we're doing here, you all are the best news source because this is, the empathy circle is like the best news source. If you can bring different people in from all different points of view, you get the, you not only take in, you know, you're listening, but you also get to speak. And the, the media is, is, is authoritarian in the sense that you're just kind of being fed this stuff and you don't get to respond and don't get heard. It's like, you know, the journalists are saying, hey, I'm here to listen to you. It's like, Listen to me, you know, pause, thanks. <laughs> um, and also um, your thought is that the best news source is an empathy circle because you get a variety of people with all different types of um, uh, outlooks and uh, that uh, there's no control over it as you would find in other kinds of news sources. Yeah, it's the part that you get in, you're involved. Like I'm involved here, I'm getting heard, right? And we're all getting heard to our satisfaction. So it's a, it's a deeper form of uh, communication than just uh, hearing some, you know, pundits, you know, on MSNBC or Fox kind of spout out about their opinions. Okay, um, so, so sorry, I don't know if I missed something, but you feel like you get a much more variety of opinions this way than you would say listening to Fox. But it's the participatory part, I think, that we're, I'm participating in a relationship with everyone here, 
it is kind of the important part, yeah. So you feel like it's the most important part is the participatory <laughs> Sorry, participation, yeah. Uh -huh. A part of uh, the circle where you're e you're all participating rather than just um, being passive and taking it in. Yeah, so I've done these circles on the topic of abortion, bringing in people from both sides of the abortion issue, for example, and you really start hearing the deeper issues and the real personal stories that are underneath that. And I just feel that's a deeper, richer way of learning and growing. Okay, so you feel like if you had two people like on the abortion issue and you hear both sides, then uh, you feel like you're learning more that way, seeing everything in more depth. Yeah, and uh, the other part is, I think from chapter 12 is about the eye contact. There's more eye contact here, like we're, we're in deeper connection and it's, and he's, uh, Snyder is talking about, oh, people turn their back on people, right? I'm not gonna talk to you, I'm not gonna listen to you here you know, everybody gets heard. You can't, you can't kind of turn your back on somebody. At least for me, the empathy circles, everyone's invited as long as they're just taking part in the process. So you, I think it kind of keeps that, that alienation from happening like uh, that he's talking about. Okay, so you feel like when he talked on chapter 12 about eye contact, that the empathy circle has that and that you can't uh, turn your back where if you weren't on screen, you could do that. Yeah, so I would, oh, time. Okay, I'll, put, I'll end there. So thank you, I feel fully heard. Okay. Um, I think uh, I got the sense from um, Donna that she didn't get to say what she wanted to say, um, that she got off track. So I, I, would you listen to me, Donna? Sure. Okay. Um, whoa. Okay. <laughs> I try. I find in the empathy circle, especially being with Edwin, that I'm that I get reactive, and um, I don't like that. <laughs> so, would you repeat that? <laughs> yeah, you find uh, when you're in the empathy circle. I don't know if you mean just with Edwin, but uh, you become reactive, and you don't like that. Right. Um, I feel like, okay, a couple of things I guess I'll, br I'll bring out on what uh, you said uh, uh, at one is, I think what Schneider was talking about, and also Aaron, um, Darren mentioned it, um, <laughs> when, he, when he was talking about being predictable on the internet versus unpredictable, he was really talking about certain groups. Um, for instance, um, this is personal. The only people that I know that supported Trump are Edwin's brother and sister. I'll, I'll stop there. Um, so you, you're just summarizing that he said um, that um, the internet makes people predictable, but you 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 think that uh, that is dependent on what groups? It's through groups, um, and the only people you know that supported Trump are Edwin's uh, brother and sister. I think you said. Yeah, and so I get a sense when I was reading that I just connect it right away with. I used to uh, read his brother Charles's Facebook and respond or his his sisters and I I I I gave up you know exactly what they were gonna say and you could put in the best article written by the best journalist and it would just be completely shot down or ignored. Yeah so you're saying you used to look at the Facebook pages and what was written by the brother and sister, brother being Charles and um, you got to the point you you would know exactly what they're they were going to say right so when when he said that i've pictured groups on the internet um 
that um, are um, taking in conspiracy theories and you know exactly what they're going to say. And he wasn't making a general comment that there's nothing out there on the internet. <clears throat> so your interpretation was that the groups on the internet are largely those supporting uh, conspiracy theories and that he wasn't talking about everything on the internet. Correct, okay. Well, I'll move, I'll move on from there. Um, as far as uh, chapter 12 and the eye contact and making small talk, um, I feel that this is so important, um, even on a personal level with say Edwin's brother and sister, I don't agree with them. I get very agitated and angry inside, um, but I try to be uh, as pleasant as I can and friendly as I can about just interacting. Yeah, so in chapter 12, you think that the uh, eye contact and the small talk that he mentions are very important and that uh, even on a personal level with Edwin's brother and sister, you may get um, irritated, but you, or not agree, but you try to stay pleasant and friendly. Right, and I don't, I don't think it's about um, issues so much uh, with, we have these silos, it's more about the peop, the individual's values that get you upset. So you don't think it's as much about the issues or the silos as the individual's values that gets people upset or gets you Cor upset? Correct. So for instance, I was saying with his brother, when it was his birthday or something, I would send a little happy birthday and not ignore it, even though I just find him infuriating. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. I feel... Uh, after you say something, I'll feel fully hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so you give an example that on the brother's uh, birthday, even though you find him infuriating at times, you do send him a happy birthday and that kind of thing. Thank you. I feel fully hurt. Okay. So I'm up. Who has, doesn't really, We're Leo, do you want to try me? Okay. Someone new. I've been in groups with some of the people a lot. Celine in particular. We, I missed you last week, Celine. <laughs> um, okay. What else to say? There's so much to say. I, I guess since we're uh, supporting critical thought, which often does not go over big these days. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll be slightly, of course, I like the book and I really appreciate Timothy Snyder. And I, I went to um, check on a 90 year old and she told me she knew his mother. They live in Ohio. He has two other brothers. So I felt very personal. But um, on the other hand, he's an historian. And some of this I'd have to agree with Yeroon. Um, it seems a little bit like living in the past. I agree with it, the eye contact and um, small talk, although I've never been good at small talk, uh, I do appreciate it. Um, and the problems with neighbors, not even knowing the, your neighbor's name. Um, I do appreciate, okay, sorry. Oh. <laughs> you made your job hard. <laughs> it's okay. Well, you, uh, Donna, you're focusing on critical thought. And um, you're at a personal level, you, you know a 90 year old who knows Schneider's mother living in Ohio, but Schneider is a historian. And so the uh, question raises, is he living in the past? In spite of his emphasis on and the importance of small talk for with neighbors, for example, uh, I'd, I'd like to hear more what you have to say about that. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Leo. Um, and also the uh, first part about the internet, I didn't pick up that he was saying anything positive. I was feeling like he wants you to read books. And I think um, my own opinion, and it's a little bit of the past, you're not gonna fight 
some of this stuff, some of this modern, but we could support an education that supports critical thinking, no matter what you're using, no matter what you're reading, um, no matter what you're viewing. So I'll stop so in, there. In general, you find Schneider emphasizes uh, books and the, the reading and the writing versus the uh, internet venue. But in either case, what's most important is critical thinking, whether it be on the internet or with a printed book or a newspaper. Yeah, or tell you can be passive or you can be active. Um, and let's see, what else about that? I, I lose my train of thought pretty easily these days. Um, yeah, and, and, and yeah, so to emphasize supporting critical thinking, I think you get good grades these days if you just go along and you don't make waves and some disbanding of books and all this stuff, it's working against critical thinking. So, um, and also just a point about the internet, I understand what he's saying. There are shocking things on the internet that may, I'm feeling positive. They make me feel negative. They don't seem true or they're shocking just for shock value. Why don't so, I stop there and then finish? Okay. Yeah, Don, Donna, you're in academia. So you see in education, sometimes students just going for the good grades, bypassing critical thinking, uh, banning of books in some schools. So you have some concerns where, where it comes to education. And, and you do agree that there, there's shocking stuff can be found on the internet. Yeah, but on the other hand, I see the internet, uh, especially like Wikipedia and things like that, um, equalizing. It is allowing people to access information that couldn't afford private sources before. So I see, you know, it's like almost anything we have can be used for positive or for negative. And in this world, modern world we live in, that's kind of the pressure. We have a lot of options that can destroy us or make us better. So that, that's my thought. So speaking up for the internet, it has a power to equalize education and make resources more of easier more easily of accessible to more people and so there are positive features of the internet that you want to endorse as an educator yeah i'm actually not i'm retired at this point i won't go into what i did in the past but <laughs> i hang out with a lot of them though um anyway thank you very much i feel heard okay Dottie, you're a retired educator and we thank you for your service in education <laughs> It's uh, been, a, I'll choose um, uh, Celine. Sure. <clears throat> We've had an interesting discussion on the uh, negative and positive factors of the internet. So we've had an interesting discussion, you think, on the negatives and the positives of the internet. And several people have brought out that the, the critical factor is critical thinking whether it's something we're watching and seeing on the internet or reading on the internet uh, or reading on, in print media, uh, it comes down to how well we do our critical thinking. And uh, the key element seems to be, or what's being emphasized is critical thinking, whether it's uh, what we're listening to or watching or reading, how are we processing it? Snyder uh, points out to, to write uh, investigative journaling, you have to think, you have to investigate, you have to write, you have to reflect, you have to re rewrite. <laughs> it's a long human process and it demands on the part of the reader a, a human process of processing all that information. So the advantages of reading is, and writing, writing and reading is it slows you down uh, to allow your brain to, to process the ideas. And Snyder talks about how uh, journalists, a good writer, have to get the information, reflect on it, write about it. Um, and a reader has also to process and think about what they're reading as, as part of their, the process. 
I think last week Schneider pointed out just the speed of the internet and how we jump from one thing to another so quickly doesn't give us enough time to digest the pause, whereas the act of reading is necessarily a slower process. Yes, yeah, so reading something or looking at something on the internet is very quick and you can jump from one topic to another and don't have to think about it very much. Um, and I forgot the last part, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. And I, I think he also points out that the, uh, or Donna just talked about the shock value of some things on the internet. Um, it, I think Schneider uses the word spectacle, that we can be pushed into spectacle uh, more easily on the internet. And another piece about the internet that uh, Schneider brings up is the shock value, the spectacle, the kind of attention getting entertainment side of. Right. It, it's designed to, to make a, with triggers to make us jump from one link to another and go down rabbit holes. And it's actually designed to um, as triggers to to catch our attention and make us go down this rabbit hole or that one. The um, Edwin brought out the point of uh, he likes um, empathy circles because it gives us a chance to do some thinking together. We're in relationship with each other. So my emphasis on human processing is kind of uh, <clears throat> multiplied in value when we do human processing together. You know, that there's a collective uh, receiving of information, thinking about mulling it over, but also digesting it, digressing with others. That's a positive feature that uh, the internet makes possible. So you're saying that Edwin uh, talked about how it is to process things in an em empathy circle where people are listening and speaking, but together. And you're taking this uh, further in terms of processing information together. And you're seeing that the internet can contribute to that. Yeah, I, I love our Zooms that we, <laughs> that we do. And a peculiar thing is about eye contact in a Zoom gallery that we're in right now, we also see our, our own eyes as well as each other. In, in person, we, I wouldn't see my eyes, I'd just see your eyes. So that's, that's a, an unusual feature of the Zoom gallery. So you're, you're talking about uh, eye contact and how uh, by way of Zoom, we do have eye contact with each other. And strangely enough, we also have eye contact with ourselves. Which is a little very good. Bizarre. And I'll just, I know time's up, but uh, given Edwin's brother and sister and my sister, maybe we should have an empathy circle for siblings or with siblings. <laughs> so you're proposing an empathy circle with siblings, your sister and Edwin's brother and sister. <laughs> Thank you, Celine. I feel, feel uh, fully heard. Thank you, Leo. Okay, um, Edwin, would you listen to me, please? Mm -hmm. Listening. So um, I'm, I want to go back to um, the solidarity movement actions and uh, Havel, whatever his name is, Vaclav Havel. Mm -hmm. You want to go back to the Solidarity movement actions and block block love hovel. And um, I was in in um, Prague many years ago, and there was the wall, this famous wall, um, where people would come at night and clandestinely, as much as possible, write messages of of hope and encouragement. So when you were in Prague uh, at that time, that there is like a wall where people would leave hopeful messages and that were encouraging to others. Well, I was there a lot at later, but the wall is still there. Mm. And it's, it's like a memorial now. Um, and another piece that, I, that was important then was, um, 
the, the music from the Beatles, from John Lennon, that was inspiring people. So you're looking at what inspired people uh, during that era, and it was the music from John Lennon, as well as like uh, this wall, people would be inspired by these messages. And it touches me tremendously, the courage of people who were doing something illegal because they could be arrested any moment for going out in the night and writing a message of hope or, you know, or writing all we need is love or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you're just really deeply moved that people would take the risk of doing this where they could be arrested just to put out these messages of uh, hope and love. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I have that in me. And maybe, mm -hmm. maybe when I was 30, I would have done things like that. I hope so. Um, I, I really admire humans who will risk their lives for mm -hmm. principles, for freedom. It really um, gives me more hope in humanity than other things. <laughs> yeah, you really uh, admire those people who will stand up for, for those values. And you're kind of questioning, wondering if you would have done it, uh, maybe in your earlier, in your 30s or so, if you would have been willing to, to do it. And you hope you would have been willing to stand up like that. Yeah, thank you. And so on a completely other topic, I actually taught critical thinking to first year students at our Funky Dunk local university for several years. Oh, so yeah, another topic is you were actually a teacher of critical thinking at your funky uh, school there for some time, several years. Yeah. And <laughs> it, I was shocked at how little the kids knew about it or were interested in it or saw any value before I got through with them. <laughs> mm, yeah. So you're surprised, shocked that they had so little knowledge about this, but they did. It sounds like they really got it once they, you were through with them. They learned mm -hmm. those. Some of them. So. But I, I got as you know, I would tell you have to quote sources and so on. Mm. I would get quotes from the Bible as a source. And then I had to go to my department head and say, what do I do with this? Mm -hmm. So you would want people to make uh, footnotes and uh, their sources. And some of you would just, uh, the students would quote the Bible and you weren't sure how to really deal with that. And you had to kind of ask for guidance. Thank you. I feel fully heard. Okay. Uh, Euron? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about the critical thinking. Like, I'm, I'm not sh quite sure what the scope is of critical thinking, what's meant by that. So, um, yeah, I'm just trying to sort of grasp. There's critical thinking of just sort of thinking deeper into a subject. Right, that's maybe one aspect of critical thinking. You were wondering what, what is meant by critical core thinking. Um, and one aspect is to go deeper into some certain subject. Yeah, and there's also, I mean, it seems like the culture is sort of based on criticism, right? It's like we have a culture of criticism that you get attention and maybe people are thinking, oh, we just criticize each other. That's critical thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Fox News and MSNBC are very critical thinkers because they just criticize the living daylights out of each other. You know, it's just like nonstop criticism. So you're wondering maybe people might actually think that they are critical thinkers because of the way they are critical about each other. Yeah, so and maybe, the politicians, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's, about, it's really yeah. humorous. If you really listen to the, even the, you know, the sort of the, when you think of the really, you know, elite politicians, they can be very critical of, of, of each other. 
I don't, even the politicians they criticize each other so maybe if that's critical thinking then they are also uh, in line with that <laughs> so i so i mean there's that where you're just like being critical criticizing you know and a lot of the fields of uh, academia seem to be about criticism we have to criticize the system we have to criticize this and uh, i do see what we're doing with the empathy circle is an alternative is that instead of criticizing something, you want to empathize uh, with it. Uh, so you're thinking maybe there's been too much encouragement of critical thinking, if, if that's the kind of critical thinking that people have in mind. And with empathy circles, we actually try to do something else. Which, yeah, uh, we, we meet reality with empathy, which is a way of sensing into and feeling into sort of reality. So. It, and it's done in a sort of an open, spacious, uh, yeah, uh, approach. Doesn't mean you agree with everything, but it's just it's sort of an attitude. Mm, yeah, the, the, the empathy circles are giving a a space for reality to meet empathy. For empathy to meet uh, reality, maybe the other way around. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, for empathy to meet reality, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, how you see that? Do you see that it's critical or not? So I'm not yeah. sure I forgot it. So I, I see it as like now I'm sharing. It's like you're not saying, hey, Edwin, you're full of shit. You know, you're being critical, saying you're not thinking right. You're not doing it right. You're you're wrong. You're just listening to me to what I have to say until I feel heard to my satisfaction. So you're meeting me with, with uh, empathy, with listening. So it's because I'm not making any opposition to you by my judgments saying that you're wrong this or that way which makes it possible for you to be met by empathy for me mm -hmm. to meet to meet your reality yeah so that's sort of different and then when it's your turn to speak you can be as judgmental as free speech as you want you know and that will be met with empathy right it's like you can say whatever you want to anyone and just that they're going to meet you with empathic listening. So we're sort of, again, we're the whole process of the empathy circle is to meet reality or meet people with empathy. And then, then afterwards you can say whatever you want. Yeah. Okay. So uh, when, when you, um, when you meet, when I meet with your reality with empathy, then afterwards, I can have my turn and I can be judgmental and say whatever I want that, that might be completely opposite to you. And then that in turn will, will meet reality. Be met with that, reality. That, I will, someone will listen to you and hear you with empathy. Yeah, yeah that, that is also a reality. It's like two different realities, but they all, they all end up in this space yeah. where they are being uh, shared. Yeah, and it's sort of how you sort of integrate. I think that's how ideas sort of integrate versus critical. Crit I mean, the critical thinking, I, I think there's the part of critical thinking, which is, well, we just want to think in deeper. We want footnotes. We want to explain where these ideas come from. That's, you know, just sort of going deeper. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I'll pause there, stop there. Um, so rather than um you're talking about integration so if you if you have like these turns where people are throwing out the reality having the space for that then, then things get integrated while well, if you are being critical and pick, nitpicking i'm not sure exactly uh, whatever <laughs> you said but um uh, that's uh, there's something different so you kind of like mm -hmm. put those two two different things or yeah. opposed to each other yeah i i feel fully heard Okay. My time was up too. I could have gone on and on. But... I'm sure there's more. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so I can pick somebody. Uh, Donna, is it? Uh, would you listen to me? Yes. All right. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, there are so many things that I was thinking about. I might share, but. Um, one thing that I keep coming back to is kind of a little bit more uh, broad and it's maybe a, too big to have in five minutes, but I have to try because that's what is alive in me mostly. Um, and that's this, this thing about like 
Oh, well, like, okay, I can relate to what Edwin said about um, the empathy circles are, we, we meet in the empathy circle. And that's our choice to go to go here because we are interested in the circle, what, what, what the topic is or, or what we're doing with this process. But that means that although we share this interest, that, that means there are also other things that we, we have not in common, that are different. So you were saying that there's so many things to choose and you're going to go a little broader and um, you related to the empathy circle. Uh, you point out that it's a choice either by the topic or the circle. It's a process. We have a shared interest. Um, and then I think what's next? Um, so that is something we share, but there are so still differences left between us. Still differences left between us, yes. Yeah, we do have some different, different, different opinions, which together with the fact that we can share them, I think makes this very interesting. So that together we have some things in common and some difference makes it very interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, because we can also share it now. Um, I think better because of what Edwin said, um, the space that we that we have to to share our reality with each other so it provides space to share our reality uh, what's in common and what's different mm -hmm. and that also reminds me of what i continuously try to think about how would would this um how can this be applied a little bit more in our, our daily lives and i think like okay one thing that came up to me is like democracy uh, i want to want to make it more local because the more i see happening worldwide that we cannot do anything about the more i think uh, my mind goes to okay that's not really my stuff and i cannot do anything about it but maybe i can maybe we can do something better uh, locally where we have more influence uh okay um, Sorry. Well, it, it reminds you of what's applied in the uh, daily lives that uh, democracy, um, you like that it be made more local um, because national, it seems too big to do anything about, but locally you think you could do more. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I kind of gave, because of this process of uh, the, these empathy meetings and I'm thinking about the topic of democracy. I, I realized maybe I can def I can derive three pillars of democracy, which is um, the community, and um, so that's doing doing things together, and then exchanging things together because you, we have trade, which I think is very important to have locally governed go governance over that, and the third one is um, uh, so community trade and security and i think empathy is actually maybe even the big, biggest big for the big, uh, mostly part of security so you you're referring to the process of three pillars of democracy uh community uh, exchange or trade and security and you think actually empathy is a great part of security mm -hmm. yeah because we cannot have security locally by using force like the government can do, but we can use empathy. We're free. There's not no law against it. Yeah, locally, uh, you can't really use the force of the government. You're saying, but what, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But you, you can use empathy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. I'm, I feel fully hurt. <laughs> that was <laughs> a is... lot. You have to write your own book. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just normal. Oh, yikes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, there, uh, okay, I have to pick someone. Who, who uh, Joan, do you want to listen for me? Sure. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to circulate. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Well, one thing I've heard, um, I'm going to be all over the place, like uh, uh, it has been said, I, it's many things and where to start. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I did hear I did hear on the news um, before getting on here that you know there's a question are Russians getting the truth about what's happening because of all the propaganda and things are closed down but they said that many Russians have friends in the Ukraine or outside or even relatives and that they're getting it through their phones and that once they have it they're spreading the word so yeah. there, there was a topic of how they <laughs> so you were wondering uh when you looked at the news where the russians were getting their information but then you found out that a lot of them have relatives or friends in ukraine and they're actually talking to each other on the phone yes that was on the news that that's how they're getting a lot of the information that is more accurate about the um invasion um Okay, so I just, that came up earlier, and I just thought I'd share that, um, that there is a, you know, there's a cultural connection, and um, uh, it's not going to be easily broken, and I also, you, you have to admire Yelinsky uh, for staying there and appearing um, really brave. Um, so I, I missed something, um, about the culture, um, shared, uh, oh, shared culture, uh, between the Russians and the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you also have a great deal of respect for Lewinsky, um, being able to stand up there, uh, under such awful situation. Yeah. I was in the Soviet Union in 1968, a long time ago. I was in college. I went with a group of students. You know, in the 68 was that year here where Martin Luther King was killed and we left when Robert Kennedy was assassinated. So it was, and it was the year that they, the Russians moved in on Czechoslovakia. In fact, I was there. Um, during that time. I was very naive. It was very dangerous. I had no idea what I was doing. Not that that matters, but. <laughs> <laughs> so you were actually in the uh, Soviet Union during 68 when everything was happening in the U.S. We had two assassinations, um, Kennedy and Martin Luther King, and uh, you, but you were young and um, you just felt like you really uh, weren't, didn't have the depth, uh, I gather, that you have uh, matured to now. And at that point, you didn't realize how dangerous it was. Yeah, and I, I bring it up because a Ukrainian gave me a pin, walked up to me and gave me a pin, and uh, it was like a freedom pin. Uh -huh. And uh, and I knew at some point it would have meaning. I've had these instances in my life where I'm given something, it makes no sense, but later has meaning. So here it is, here it is. Well, um, so when you were there, uh, somebody from Ukraine actually gave you a freedom pen, pin and you just wondered um, what the significance what might be, but now you realize this is some pattern that you've seen. You might get something and that eventually it has a real significance to your life. Yeah. Um, and why I was there, I don't know. Um, oh, what else, what else? Well, I, I, I hear a lot of what you're saying. I agree with um, many things that don't need to be repeated. Um, I think I could stop there. It's enough for now. Thank you. Okay, you you agree with most of what's been said um, and you were just wondering where you wanted to go, but you decided to stop right there. Yeah, yeah I'll just say the local emphasis I've discussed before when it, he wrote about it and uh, 
it's appealing, although challenging. The local is no breeze, but uh, okay. Stop so, there. So um, as we talked about, and he wrote about local has uh, some uh, bearing now for you or that you're thinking about it, but you said it's not a breeze. It's not an easy task to take on. Uh, let's see, um, I guess, uh, Leo, would you listen to me? Um, yeah, uh, one thing that um, I kind of wanted to go back to, I think actually Donna may have brought it up. Um, I've jotted it down. Snyder being from the past because he's a historian. I have seen him out there a lot because I watched MSNBC. Um, but um, I think the book, which he wrote at the beginning of the Trump administration, um, I think that's what that's what the that was his um, what is the word <laughs> senior moment that was the um, impetus uh, for for writing this uh, because I feel like we we are dealing with exactly what he talked about in uh, Nazi Germany. So uh, Joan, you're going back to a remark of Donna that Schneider is a historian and you're putting his book on tyranny in context that he wrote this book on tyranny when Trump was elected and that you see as he saw <laughs> uh, analogies between the Trump uh, presidency and administration and Nazi Germany. Right, so even though he's saying in the past is is something that we don't tend to look at anymore. He's worried that um, uh, um, part of the education and all, people just have such a short memory. They don't go back to the past, but we can learn so much as I have felt reading this book about the past to help us what's happening in the present. So reading, uh, history, reading about the past can help us in the present. And uh, there are analogous times that we're living in. And uh, so you're grateful for that. Right, and there's so many things over the last four years. Um, actually, I was lucky to have read this um, when I started with Indivisible, when Trump would do some outlandish, you know, all the lies and um, using the military and wanting parades. And, and I just think, oh my gosh, um, this, is, this is it. This is, <laughs> this is what happened in Germany. So you experienced this uh, analogy or similarity between uh, Nazi Germany and um, America in the early part of the century or 2020 as um, it was too true, the, the analogies. And you had joined a resistance group called Indivisible. And uh, so you were alert to these uh, consistent um, uses of language and uh, propaganda that was coming out of Trump. And the propaganda against the press, that they are the enemy of the people. Um, what just surprised me was that it was resonating with so many people across this uh, country. Um, that, that was actually pretty shocking to me. You were shocked that Trump's remarks and uh, adversity against the press were resonated with so many people. And uh, that that's an instance of propaganda that rang too true for you, horrified you. Right. Um, I did bring this up one other circle. Um, we actually had a tragedy in our family um, a journalist who was a local journalist, but a fantastic newspaper, the Capital Gazette, which is right outside, uh, it's in Maryland, right outside of Washington. 
um, there was a shooting of five journalists and our cousin was murdered. So, Joan, you shared a story that one of your cousins, a local journalist for Capital Gazette, was killed with four other journalists, and that this was a, a true experience of yours. And it was right after Trump had called um, journalists evil um, enemies of, um, of the people. And of course, this person was ill to do this, but um, this, uh, the, there are a lot of people that need mental health uh, help in this country. And if they get the wrong information, um, it can be extremely dangerous. So this uh, killing of journalists occurred right after Trump had called the press the enemy. And unfortunately, people of, of poor mental health may pick up that message and act on it literally. Right. I don't think I have time. Um, I, there were two directions I wanted to go, three actually. <laughs> um, but I'm going to say one quick thing about critical thinking. This is why I feel like the conspiracy theories are rampant. You will find that a lot of those people do not read books other than the Bible. And uh, my own connection with Edwin's family, this is true. And I'm using them too much, I know. <laughs> but that's all that, that's, that is um, the specimens that I have to be able to, you know, do my scientific work. But I'm getting that sense that it's going out the window if you don't read. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. You, you added an encore that you've, in your experience, you find uh, <laughs> people that lack critical thinking don't read very much, except maybe the Bible. Thank you. I feel fully heard. Well, I'll choose um, Jeroen. Would you be my listener? Yes, gladly. I think Edwin uh, posed a problem that we confuse critical thinking with criticism, <laughs> and they're entirely different meanings. Uh, oh yeah, uh, okay. Um, like Ed Edwin told, uh, you said, say maybe Edwin is confusing critical thinking with criticism, and and you you your opinion is that they're just completely different. Yeah, not Edwin personally, but he he notes that in the culture we have a culture of criticism. I thought that was a great example of uh, the kind of culture we have that influences politicians and journalists. Uh, we have a culture of criticism rather than a culture of critical thinking. Right, so you're not blaming Edwin. It's just that the culture seems to confuse the two. And uh, there's a culture of criticism. In academia, I, I think uh, critical thinking means you, you're, you look for the perspectives of others. You try to find the identify sources of your understanding. You believe in footnotes, <laughs> you reference. But it's a matter of, it's an assumption that truth is uh, perspective, per, perspectival. You know, we all have a point of view about truth. And that critical thinking allows you to become aware of your own biases and sources, as well as that of others. And you try to get all of that on the table so that there's a chance of greater consensus of what's true. Okay, so you refer, you refer, you refer especially to uh, the science community or the academics that they have that their, their idea about uh, critical thinking is that they, they, they seek to consider the perspectives of others and they are aware that their own perspective is biased. Therefore, they, they try to look for other perspectives. We need other people to become aware of our own biases. So we, we need actually other people to, to reflect and uh, show us that we do have a bias, which we otherwise don't notice. There, there is a bias in education of the solitary thinker. 
that each of us uh, does our thinking on our own, that we're autonomous and independent of anybody else. Hmm. So education has a bias towards thinking that that we should be thinking not like, just by ourselves, but on our own. And then that, that's the only way to, and that, that we can actually come to an unbiased opinion through that. You know, there's a famous statue by Rodin, of the thinker. Remember that big old colossal man and he's, <laughs> he's mulling things over. Uh, a different image for education would be an empathy circle. What if uh, a class was graded on their group, uh, group, a group process? I was in a class once where the grade came out of a group teamwork. And uh, rather than everybody write their own essay or pass their own test, that the grade was dependent on the interaction and interdependence of a small group of learners. Okay, so you're thinking as uh, the way that currently education views critical thinking as the Rodin's statue of the guy like resting on his uh, hand and just mulling things over. Well, you think maybe it's more useful if people are actually doing something together or coming up uh, with, with doing a task together, maybe some, some, some intelligent task. And uh, you've had experience with a class where the grade was depending on the interdependence between the students. Yeah, it was a group project. Okay, a group project. So I, I'm going to go to a, a webinar tomorrow night out of California on the philosophy of education. I'll bring uh, some of this thinking to that opportunity. Oh, so you're attending a webinar tomorrow about the philosophy of education and thinking maybe what you realized here you want to bring that to that uh, webinar and see what happens and just a pet peeve on the question of uh are the ukrainian are the russians getting their truth and uh are there big lies being told and the one that struck me was uh putin calling ukraine that they're going to clean up their nazism whereas the president of ukraine is Jewish heritage and uh, suffered greatly during the, as Poland did with uh, the Nazi invasions. But how ironic to call Ukraine Nazis. So you're, it's a pet peeve of you to, to, to hear about uh, like the way that the uh, Russians are being told about the Ukraine uh, president. As, or at least in Ukraine, there, there, there to be some, some kind of Nazism that has to be uh, like th th driven out while well, actually the, the president there has, has a Jewish background and, and it's, it has suffered greatly from, from those kind of uh, um, yeah, dictatorial uh, things. Thank you, Joe, and I, I feel fully hurt. Okay. Wow. Um, um, so I'm not sure who's been. Who's Edwin. Been. Edwin hasn't spoken in a while. He probably oh, yeah. has collected some things to, to say. Great. Edwin, do you want to listen to me first? Yes, listening. Um, okay, that, that was quite heavy what I uh, heard from the last two speakers. Um, so that put me a little bit off my own uh, train of thought. <laughs> mm, without, so following without... these, what the last two speakers said it was heavy, which kind of threw you off from your own thinking, your own train of thought. Yeah, without giving any new one. <laughs> 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 I just enjoy listening and uh, yeah, just hearing those stories. So you just enjoyed hearing those stories and no new thoughts have come up. Yeah, I just can try to remember my old ones. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's very, that's very relevant. Yeah, so you're uh, trying to remember what were you thinking about before, and maybe they're not even that relevant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but um, in terms of, yeah, I, I just keep like 
going back and forth between the two perspectives of like geopolitics and the importance and, and the tragedy to what can we do what, what mm. what's our own role so you just and, keep going back and forth between the geopolitics and then really what can you you really do what can you have influence on maybe the at a local level or yeah although locally it seems things seem so nice compared to uh to what's going on in ukraine and uh, similar issues in around the world yeah you have a pretty nice uh, where you are compared to the ukraine and so many other places in the world yeah and then and that just gives me comes that lets me come back to what i was thinking i think we do have some issues that even in our own situation maybe even worse than in ukraine we i think we have in my local uh, in my country i think there's a lack of building community which is in part also not very helped by the amount of hours people spend to make money so you're having some concern about the time uh not enough time spent on community building where you are because they're very trying to make money yeah and i think this might get worse and if if i if, if the current economic directions are, are continuing like this then if people's purchasing power goes down they might be even more stuck with working for money and not being have any space to build community yeah if uh, the economy keeps going like it is uh, then getting worse then they'll be spending even more time trying to make money and less time for community even more so yeah and, and then the only thing they can do is look online and find people with the same opinion and just repeat it to, to each other yeah so there's less time for community building and they'll just go spend more time finding community where they're just kind of repeating the same thing to each other so another kind of a downward spiral it sounds like mm -hmm. yeah exactly so yeah that's something that worries me um so that that's why i'm thinking okay let's go back to how do we solve those issues mm -hmm. and uh, that's relating to also the money that, that we try to make um, but that also relates back to Ukraine because what I see is that um, that, that, that it's being used as an excuse to just like keep the monetary system as it is and and and, and blame it on, on some other factors than mismanagement so you're really looking for ways of addressing this problem of uh of community building and and uh the issues of money and and so it's like maybe trying to do some problem solving there but the the issue in ukraine just keeps the money structure the way it is yeah it just keeps just confirms that there's no hope anything is going to improve nationally or globally and that we really need to make some work on this locally and also especially on, on, on the way money works and the banking system mm -hmm. so you think there's real need for changing the banking system and to, to make real changes and that was the time yeah thanks okay that's that's good i feel very hurt okay uh so we have three minutes um how do you want to handle that celine well, um, I'd like to offer if anybody has a thought that they haven't been had a chance to express. Okay, Donna, you got like a, a minute and a half. Lots of time. <laughs> oh, well, just picking up on uh, this messaging thing where, um, you know, Putin was getting um, charged with being uh, like the Nazis. And he was, he was uh, invading territories without cause. And then he turns it around, uh, Leo mentioned this, and calls Zelensky, who's partly, Jew, you know, in part Jewish, um, a, a Nazi, and we have to go in there, he's telling his people because of that. This, this, this little trick of turning that message around, which Trump did, we've talked about that in other groups of 
lock her up and he's the criminal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is getting so common that I hope everyone sees through it now because uh, it's just becoming a manipulative. It's hard to get to the truth when people keep doing this, like turning everything around, mixing everything up, especially the leaders. That was just a thought from uh, what Leo mentioned. Thank you. Anyone else have a, a last thing to I'll, say? I'll Eddie? throw in, and I know you're, you're speaking about community building. I think what we're doing here is community building. So if you can bring empathy <laughs> circles into your local community, that, uh, that it does build community because everyone gets heard and everyone gets seen. And I think that's kind of the, the core of community building, then maybe some activities on top of that. That's it. Are we out of time? Yep, we have one minute. <laughs> well, I, I just appreciate it. Um, I've been so upset about uh, Ukraine and feeling helpless. Um, and uh, this book just dovetails so much with uh, what's happened there that I, I really appreciate it being able to say something about it, but not nearly as much as this. It looks like we're going, right? I see the rooms up there. <laughs> uh I wanted to say one thing, which is I get nonviolent news. It's uh, online and they have a photograph of uh, lines of people standing, holding hands, Russians, 1800 Russians uh, resist expressing their opposition. And I just so appreciate their courage. Yeah, there um, when uh, Rachel Maddow last night, they had whips were out. <laughs> they had a lot of different people at all different levels and businesses and airlines and doing just something, just you know, getting that message out. No, we're not going to Russia. We're not supporting this. We're not giving concerts there. We're you know just trying to block them out. So, I mean, that gave me a little bit of something to feel like you wanna be able to help them. It's just so awful to see them so helpless. Hey, welcome back everyone. Uh, Larry was gonna debrief us, give us, go and call on each person to debrief. All right, so we'll just go around the screen and ask everyone to share for, I guess, 30 seconds to a minute. And what was your experience like in an empathy circle to be able to discuss topics that um, can be um, polarizing? But what was your experience like to, to do that in an empathy circle? And I'll start with Jana. Um, and yeah, I feel that even though we, I think it was the first time that I really felt like what Edwin says that, you know, your favorite topic is the polarizing topics and the conflict because um, because we, there was, we were able to connect and relate very well to uh, these difficult um, topics. We talked about vaccines uh, quite a bit and the heart and Boober and cut. That's enough. Thank you, John. And Erin, would you share, please? Yes, this is my third time in the circle. And um, the title of the chapters, one was investigate and one was uh, small talk. And we ended up doing that as a group, investigating and having small talk from personal experience at the end of our session. So that made it full circle and I enjoyed everyone's comments. Thank you, Erin. And Sally, would you share please? I uh, came in, I'm not feeling too great. Um, and I came out and now I feel great and empowered 
And I'm just thinking that um, empathy circles and power and um, put people in a better spot, healthier. Thank you, Sally. And Max, would you share, please? Oh, and I was on mute. <laughs> Max, you're on mute, and I was on mute too, trying to tell you you're on mute. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. I was on mute. So, so now I'm not. Um, I really, I fully enjoyed our talk together and uh, getting beyond just the uh, subjects of investigation and having small talk uh, and, and making eye contact to, to getting more to, to contact and finally having, uh, men you mentioned uh, love even. Uh, I found found your mention of love. I found it uh, really wonderful, given well superficial divisions uh, between people, which which can uh, apparently separate people, while actually, well, we're all human, uh, and uh, let's leave it there. I think that's that's enough. We're all human. Thank you, Max. And love is all, as the Beatles uh, sing, I believe. <laughs> love is all. <laughs> and thank you, Max. And Giroun, would you share, please? Oh, I just enjoyed the circle. I felt really like, even though it's very like overwhelming for me to have all those different topics and a very intense because there were very heavy things that are that have been shared. And still I felt safe to just like go whatever direction was alive in me. And uh, I felt like it was peaceful to, uh, and, and not, I felt safe that even if people were uh, having op opposing opinions, well, it would be mostly agreed, but even if it would be there, then uh, that, that wouldn't be a problem. Thank you, um, Leo, would you share please? Uh, yes, I, the, the uh, conversation uh, really popped for me when people shared personal experiences. Selena uh, shared about a memorial wall in Prague where at night they would come to uh, exchange uh, secret messages that were illegal. So they had this underground uh, network of communication. And Joan shared how a cousin of hers was killed with four other journalists because the, this person who was mentally distraught heard Trump call the press the enemy and took that tragically in a literal way. And Donna shared her experience in the uh, Soviet Union in 1968 and familiar with the solidarity movement in Poland and a, and a uh, Ukrainian at that time coming up to her and giving her a freedom pin that she that means so much more to her today. So I appreciate those uh, rich, uh, rich, rich, rich resources of personal experience that were shared. Thank you, Leo. And Celine, would you share, please? Yeah, I think um, the empathy circles creates a container for these maybe difficult topics and slows things down so that everybody can be heard. And I think it works. So that's it. Thank you, Celine. Donna, would you share, please? Yes, hi. Uh, you probably know this. I just want to mention that uh, uh, Timothy Snyder's next book is on the Ukraine. And this was, I don't know if it's done or coming out, but it was before this, you know, just happened, um, which is his area. He's a professor and I think it's one of his areas, Eastern Europe. Anyway, that should be an interesting book. Um, 
Yeah, it, well, the empathy circles, I think it can, I, I'm not tired today, good. Um, I, I think it can be a little tiring, but I think the one thing that I've found, it really keeps you from, um, like I, I do listen, but I think I listen selectively as much as I don't think I do. So I select what's supporting and refuting my own opinion. Um, whereas the empathy circle, especially when you're the one listening, forces you to listen to what they're saying without that happening. And it becomes a discipline the more you do it. So, um, so that's good. Um, I can't process everything that was said. We've said a lot. Uh, one thing that Edwin brought up was the different, because we talked a lot about critical thinking and um, the difference between critical thinking and criticizing. And that's, to me, worth thinking about um they're different so thank you thank you donna and joan would you share please yeah um i particularly enjoyed um our conversation today i think we there was i came in just so distraught about what's happening in ukraine and i feel that um we covered a lot of topics today with um, great insights from the members in the group, and I particularly appreciated that. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. And I, I would just like to share that, you know, I think we're actually accomplishing what the churches are supposed to accomplish, and they're not accomplishing it. And I think we are accomplishing it. So, Edwin, how was your experience? Uh, yeah, we talked a, a bit about the uh, Ukraine, and I, I have been thinking of, about that a lot, that uh, perhaps even holding some uh, empathy circles for Ukrainians. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Facebook groups and um, you know, a lot going on in, in the media to maybe put out a call, set a time, and have uh, a space for Ukrainians to join in, in democracy circles or empathy circles where they could connect with with uh, non Ukrainians to be it. And I think that could be supportive, it can be very alienating, uh, you know, very fear, a lot of fear and anxiety. And if you have other people who are just willing to listen to you and, and be there and be present that that can be very supportive. So if anybody's interested in that do uh, email me and maybe I'll send out an email to the to the list to see if there's a group that would like to to uh, 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 help uh, organize that it would not be too hard just to set a date and time and invite people and post to the different uh, Ukrainian uh, Facebook groups and see if they're interested. So let me uh, post the, uh, this is the uh, Democracy Circle Evaluation Form. If you could fill that out, add any comments uh, just for the feedback that we can take and to improve the circle, the democracy circle practice, uh, and volunteer. I'm gonna gonna put that plug in for volunteering for Edwin for Congress. You know, so uh, do check that out. You can go through, and if you want to help volunteer on the campaign, it's basically to do uh, empathy centered, you know, cultural development. That's really put that front and center for the culture. So that's what the campaign's about. So that's all I have. Um, so Joan, any sort of final thoughts before we close? Um, no, I, I, nothing today. Thank you. Okay. So see you next week and maybe do some jazz hands if you for goodbye. And if you're a facilitator, stay back for a few minutes just to debrief. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.